Dell <laughs> folks, people, peoples, uh, session. And what this is going to be is kind of really a, a, just a smidgen of history again and philosophy uh, and just kind of, I, I guess in a sense, a little bit of a, of a pep talk and an intro talk. Because now, after six years, I know what's worked and what hasn't worked in terms of really unifying and getting people involved in the network. And my, my win, and everybody has to have a goal going into it, my win is I'd love to see more participation on the forum. And we're going to work with Tommy this week about what we're going to do with the website, with Google Hangouts, different things like that to better <laughs> to better serve your needs. I don't know what, where that came from. Um, hold on just a second. Uh, your computer's just trying to get online. I know, it's just thanks. Thanks. <laughs> but it'll keep trying, right? It will? Yeah, just hit accept. Just hit accept it. Oh, oh boy. Well, well, next time it comes up, I'll accept it. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so I want you to, before I go through this, and it's which is some topical areas. I just want you to think about, okay, there's no, number one, here and going forward on the game forum or to me or to anybody else in the game network. There is, and everybody says this, every speaker says this, but it's, it's hard to accept this. There's no such thing as a stupid question. And I can look around the room and I look at different things that people put on, you know, that John put on about one of his hurdlers that, you know, that asking for questions, and some elicited a lot of responses, some of them did need a lot of responses, okay? But there is such, so much knowledge now in the network that it's a shame not to tap into it. You spent time and money to come, you know, and so use it. And the other thing that's on, when you fool around, play around with the site a little bit, because Tommy's gonna want feedback, look at the resources that are on there. Look at some of the old posts. Uh, look at the, the um, what, what do we call it? library, okay? And, and there's some really good stuff on there, stuff that I've collected throughout my career that is not, not for publication. And the, the only thing before I start my presentation, the game network material is for you. I want to make that clear. Nothing that's, you, you know, no, nothing from here goes on YouTube. If it does, you just, you're done. I mean, I, you're just, you're not coming back and that is, for us to share, um, Kevin Moody, where are you? You, asked, you, you? you remember a couple of years ago, you said, can I, you know, and, and I appreciate you asking, because then that was very professional. He said, can I share it with the people at my clinic? Absolutely, but share it in a, in a non-reproducible um, or transferable format, right? Because in today's world, you give somebody a stick, and next thing you know, it's, you know, somebody's presentation on, you know, in a, Journal. I've had that happen to me a few times. So we're clear on that before we start, okay? And uh, I, my daughter is going to come later on to the, the, the just, I, I was thinking, because I, if I showed you the original thing, what we were going to name this, it was awful. And she, she calls me and she says, Dad, why don't you just call it GAIN, Gambit Athletic Improvement Network. Bingo, Peanut, that's why you went to Rice and majored in sports management. And, you know, and that. So good job. All right. Um, 44 years of coaching, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's just it's just like anything else. It's more a matter of kind of enduring and persevering in certain situations and that. But I think, and, and I'm speaking for myself in this vein, but I think I can speak for everybody that's, that's in here. Some of you have very few years of experience. Some of you have many, many more. But there have been influences and mentors, okay? I said to somebody today, the first three clinics I went to I, I, I didn't, I was thinking about this on the drive. John Madden, everybody, the, the Americans know who John Madden was. You talk about passionate. I thought that's the way coaches had to act then. I mean, passionate, fired up, just like he was on TV. He's got chalk, he's got a piece of chalk, he's writing over his shoulder, he had a tie on, the tie's undone, the shirt's unbuttoned. I mean, this guy's passionate, and it was awesome what he talked about. And fortunately, I didn't have to play against his team. I was second string. I just Thank God I didn't have to ever play. And then and the second clinic I went to was Bill Bowerman. Well, Bill, you talk about passionate and knowledgeable. And the third clinic I went to was Tom Talabs, Carl Lewis's coach, who was a coach here at University of Houston. My God, it's been downhill ever since then. That was the first 18 months, you know. 
But I figured that's the way it's all about, you guys. This is what it's, you know, so that's that part of it. That guy there, aside from my parents, is the reason I'm here, Mr. Keel. I will never call him Charles. That was my high school basketball coach, my high school history teacher. All of you have somebody in your life. It didn't have to be a coach. This guy was so far ahead of his time. You know, we talk about all the skill act stuff and all of that. He didn't know what that was. He was a fighter pilot over Normandy in World War II as a 19-year-old. And when, in class, when we, because we were talking about D-Day in class, and all of us walked out of class and going, you know, this is 1963, so it was only 14 years before that. Yeah, he was, he was there. He was a little short guy, smoked at halftime. You know, it's a different world, okay? Mistakes and failures. You guys, if you haven't made mistakes and you haven't had failures, you haven't tried. All right, I'll share with you a lot of those and we will. Lessons and epiphanies. I'm gonna, and, and a lot of you are gonna share those, okay? And, and, and last, questions and challenges going forward. I have more questions that, that I want to ask of people in here. We had a great discussion over at the hotel last night just about analytics and metrics and, you know, all of this kind of stuff and how to use it. Randy will and that, and talk about it. We'll all talk about it. So these are all things that, that, that I think that, that I've seen in a lot of coaches that I've worked with and, and, and with myself, okay? Um, from uh, 1962, right? Times they are changing, Bob Dylan. Last verse, I won't try to sing it. Uh, I could probably do as good a job as Bob now, but I won't. But I love the, 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 the last three lines. And the first one now will later be last for the times they are changing. And here's, if you don't believe this, the times are changing and they are changing fast. They thought they were changing fast, that they didn't even have a clue. Times are changing, and here's the illustration. Some of you have seen this because I've used it in a lot of presentations but it's still really relevant. I changed it from a tsunami to an avalanche. Okay, and this is what's happening. From the dawn of civilization to 2003, there are a total of five exabytes were collected. All right, an exabyte is one quintillion bytes. I wasn't real good at math, but I know a quintillion's a heck of a lot more than a million. All right, and if you look at this, in 2012, two years ago, five exabytes of data were collected every two days and they project in the near future data will be collected at the rate of five exabytes every few minutes. Well guys, we are at five exabytes right now. I just looked it up on the IBM website and we are at five exabytes right now. So where's it gonna be six months from now? A year from now? And, and our job and the people that we coach and the information that we have to acquire is how are we gonna manage this, you guys? We have to really, really think about and how we're gonna use a filter to separate the wheat from the chaff, okay? That, that to me is a really, really big task that, that I'm finding more and more uh, difficult in a sense, okay? Huh. We all chuckle, right? We live in a hypokinetic society symptomized by exercise deficit disorder. We chuckle, but those are 11, 12 year olds, you're gonna be coaching those guys in four years as high school coaches. And college coaches, you can go to all the combines, you can go to all those kinds of things, but we're gonna get more and more of these guys. Ed gave me a really interesting statistic yesterday. Across the way, if you're not aware, go to Google Earth and look at, and this is the world's largest medical industrial complex. And during, correct, make sure I got this right, Ed. During working hours, the population in that medical center exceeds any city in Texas. Think about that for a minute. Across so, huh? Sorry, across the street. Across the street. And, and, and that's disease, okay? So we've got to be, and then, but that represents, uh, this picture to me represents a lot of opportunities in terms of what we can do. That's the way I look at it. Because otherwise, uh, I don't want to get up tomorrow morning <laughs> if it doesn't, okay? So as we look at that. Um, now we're going to hear a lot, and, and I know we'll, this will be alluded to a lot at different times, and this has been an ongoing um, thing for me since 2012, since the Olympics. It was ongoing, and we had it at UNC a couple of weeks ago. We had it um, in, Aus in not Australia, in New Zealand when I was there for three weeks. Who's driving the ship? Is it the coach? Is it the <laughs> sports scientist? Where is, there, is, it the, is it the doctor? I, I won't, there's another situation I just ran into again 
head on again, where it's a, a doctor pushing for a medically driven model, which we know doesn't work. But, you know, when you say, I'm a doctor, you have a lot more power. An MD has a lot more power than anybody else in, in, a, in these environments. So you look at science, and that's evidence-based practice. In the middle is performance enhancement, and you look at practice-based evidence. And for me, those are, that's fluctuating. You know, art, science, art, science. And we, we've got to figure out a way to do that. This is a terrific cartoon I found on Twitter the other day. <laughs> if I hear one more, no offense to you guys under 35, 20 something or 30 something coach say, Do you have a peer reviewed study to back up what you're doing? I'll find one. Believe me, I can find one to back it up. It may be totally invalid, but guys, every one of you in this room is about producing results. If we wait for peer reviewed study, the world will pass us by. Okay? And I'll give you an example in a minute on my favorite topic, the hamstring. <laughs> it's reserved. It's come out to my favorite topic. So the mission of gain. I sent this to you just real quick, but I want to highlight a couple of points. Is focus on the possibilities for enhancing human movement with no limits or limitations. Okay? And emphasize connections and links, not only between body parts, but between disciplines. The biggest thing that I've seen happen in my lifetime, and we, I, I had a, you can talk to Melissa, her college roommate's husband has cancer. It's not terminal, hopefully. <coughs> Stanford Medical Center. She worked as an administrator at Stanford Medical Center. She could not get the radiologist to talk to the oncologist to talk to the various specialists. But because she had worked there, she just physically knew people and grabbed them and took them down the hall. We have the same thing happening in sport today where we have silos. The trainer doesn't talk to the coach. The coach doesn't talk to the strength coach. The strength coach, you know, and that kind of stuff. So that's what I'm saying, connection between disciplines and connection in the body. What's cool about GAIN is we're all in one room and we're going to share and talk about everybody's different perspective, okay? For, and here's the, the, the for, these are the, the goals of GAIN, providing the rear defining education experience for all of us. I've never been one to set um, low the bar low. Okay? Define the field of athletic development. Reinforce the concepts that training is testing and testing is training, and training is rehab and rehab is training. Those of you that came to building and rebuilding in 1992, that concept was there and then. And the, the, what Steve is going to show you with stick drill tomorrow morning is a terrific diagnostic test, better than the PCA in some respects. Once you learn those movements and you watch what he's going to show you, you're going to find out where the connections occur, where the break, if you want to call it, I don't necessarily like the term, but energy leaks and things like that, that's a good guru kind of term, right? So, uh, you know, put the plug in that leak in that hole. So, but that's, that's what this is about, okay? So our, our goal for gain 2014 is focus on the process of developing athletes from the first step in the sport to the step onto the podium. Um, the, with thanks to Chris for, to Chris Plum first, and then the other swim coaches and that, it is just really, really neat to go in this case to a swim club and to start at five o'clock or maybe first. With, it initially starts with the senior kids first and then start going down the line, you know, to the eight-year-old, and just see. And within one day, I had an amazing experience in 1998. In the morning, I worked with the U.S. World Cup men's soccer team. That evening, with a U-12 and a U-14 boys soccer team. What do you, was there any commonalities? They played with a round ball. But you know what the commonalities were? The movement errors up here at the World Cup team were the same movement errors the 12 and 13. And, and, and there was nothing wrong. That's, that's the reality. You'd say, oh, you've got to do different things. Yeah, you've you got to massage things a little bit differently, but the body's the body, and, and, and we have to recognize that, okay? Um, barriers and limits. Who's that? Bannister. All the Brits you've got to tell, right? Sir Roger, Sir Roger Bannister. And that's 60 years ago last month. 
And when I started coaching in 1969, there was a lot of talk about barriers and limits. There was a guy named Brutus Hamilton who just retired as a track coach at Cal, and he put out a list of the ultimate marks ever that would be achieved starting at the 100-yard dash, so a different time was, on up to the marathon. And, you know, every one of those marks has been exceeded by huge percentages, okay? And, it, 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 and, and it's interesting because, but this guy refused to believe in the barriers. He was told that if he broke four minutes, his heart would explode. Literally, if you go back and read some of the accounts, you can't, and every, he was told you can't do it. He trained a maximum of 50 minutes a day, five days a week. Before he broke four minutes, he took seven days off. Off was standing on his feet as a resident in, you know, in, uh, in, in, in medicine. So, but he didn't train, he didn't run a step, okay? And here's what, here's what Bannister said. Let's, I'll get it. Slow down. Oh, geez, I, I, guys, I get too excited. <laughs> there, look what Bannister said. Kind of interesting, isn't it? We were talking yesterday about some of the um, studies done on human, human um, ligament and, uh, and tendon. Dead cadaver studies, particularly looking at the elbow, where they isolate, you know, that ligament, and it, so they'll tell you how many foot pounds of force or how many newtons of torque or whatever you need to break it. And the human body all the time exceeds those at the ACL, anything like that. Why? Because number one, it's living tissue, and number two, it's not just that tendon or that ligament. The body's smarter than that, isn't it? It's going to integrate. It's going to use the wisdom to dissipate the forces over as many joints as possible. And yeah, there's those unique situations where that happens, and that keeps Bill in business in that, you know? So, <laughs> okay? So, there are no barriers, barriers or limits, right? Okay, we hear a lot about this. It's evidence-based. What's the evidence? What's the peer-reviewed evidence? Well, I gotta pick my favorite exercise. You guys know what, a lot of you guys know what it is, right? The Nordic hamstring curl, which is really, for those of you that don't know, was invented by a guy named Sam Adams at UCSB in about 1975, and UCSB is the gauchos. So it should be the gaucho hamstring curl, okay? And so the evidence is, based on one study that everybody keeps going back to, of a thousand first division soccer players in Norway that did this exercise. We don't know what else they did, but this is the exercise they did, and it reduced hamstring pulls. So now everybody's glommed on to this study. And every time I tweet about it, I get this study shoved down in my face. And I know that if you do this exercise, I can guarantee you, as I said in my tweet this morning, that if I play your team, and I do it my way, and you do this, over the course of, 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 you pick the period of time, we will stay healthy, and we will kick your ass. Because, just like yesterday, you're going to be pulling people off with hamstrings. And all this posterior chain baloney in that, about focusing on the hamstring, uh, you know, we saw it in AFL and, and you got in, in Australia, we've seen it in, in league and union, we've seen it in, in, in soccer and that. If it worked, you guys, so here's the evidence I'm looking for. If it worked, why aren't hamstring pulls going away? I got involved in professional baseball by chance in 1987. And everybody did all these things, right? We stopped those things after two years, and our shoulder injuries went that way. Everybody still does them, shoulder injuries are going that way. Evidence-based, okay? So what do you, what's the alternative? If you criticize something, you know what? It's real complicated, guys. You do lunch and reach. You do step-ups. You do stuff that isn't real sexy. You can't give it fancy names. You work all three hamstrings. You work them in all planes. And you do it frequently, like every day, in warm-up. It's called lunge and reach series. It's not complicated, guys. But everybody wants something that you can wrap in some kind of, I am, I'm, sarcasm is not a good teaching tool, but I'm being a little bit sarcastic right now, that you can wrap into a neat little package and say, this will prevent it. Okay. 
but if you understand, and I'll, I'll explain it more tomorrow, and I know every <coughs> Bill, Randy, a lot of people here Ed, will go into this more. If we understand, if we get under the hood, if we have Franz Bosch here, and we look at how muscles function, we figure out right away why one is better than the other. Okay? And then, to quote Bill Knowles, all training is brain training. So you are what you train to be. And this is still a hamstring curl. It's just you don't have a machine. It's still a hamstring curl. You say, well, Vern, what about eccentric? Yeah, but what about, what kind of eccentric? What about isometric? And what about the ground? Okay, so enough said. You just give me something to talk about at Val Hall tonight, okay? I don't know what that is. I mean, I, somebody in here, that's like way beyond the math that I ever took. I mean, first year algebra three times, they still never got to that, so anyway. <laughs> Um, my, my big thing is, you guys, and you, a lot of you guys that know me, don't complexify. Don't complexify. It doesn't impress anybody to, you know, to talk about tonification of the central nervous system. It's just frickin' balance. <laughs> yeah, I look at Steve. It's just balance, guys. Call it what it is, you know? I mean, where's Pablo? You here? You still awake? Right? I have to come over and talk to you guys. My Spanish is much, not as good as his English. Right? But I have to convey some of these messages in Espanol, in English, and somewhere in between, right? So the goal, it, it, and if I made it complicated, nobody's going to understand it. And that's, you know, that's two different languages. But I get in situations now, and I'm listening, and I'm like, what language are you talking? Okay? Simplify, you guys, simplify. Find it, that's what you have to do. Einstein said, if, I think it's, if, if he said, if you can't explain to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. If some of you guys, when I said this in that online seminar, Richard Feynman, who I, I wish I could have met, and, uh, who's a Nobel Prize winner for physics, articulated uh, a bunch of formula for quantum physics. He's walking with, with James Geick, the <coughs> author of the book Genius, which is a really good book to read. They're walking across the Caltech campus and they're just kind of talking, and the Caltech campus is much like this, old trees, real pretty. And there's a gardener over here, and the gardener says, oh, Dr. Feynman, how are you doing? And he talks, and Dr. Feynman, I mean, Feynman was absolutely the greatest common man. He never, never lorded his PhDs and all his things. He actually hung out in strip clubs, anyway, and, and drew pictures of the strippers. But that's on the side. You can read the book if you want more detail. And uh, so he said, the gardener says, Dr. Feynman, what are you working on? Feynman stops three minutes to the gardener, explain quantum physics, and the gardener goes, oh, that's cool. They walk away, and the, and the author goes, I don't believe it. But see, that's genius. That's really being smart, isn't it? He wasn't trying to impress the author, or what well, he did, <laughs> and he wasn't trying to impress the gardener. All right, so what do I have to do, Greg? It accepts. It accepts, <laughs> but hey, thanks for it. But you know, over in my room, it wouldn't let me accept it. It said I was unaccepted. All right, good. Uh, there we go. Okay. I don't, no, no comments. <laughs> okay. Right? I have to put soccer instead of football. I mean, look, you put in, um, you name somebody else, you put Messi in there, a lot of different things happen, right? You put in, I don't know, uh, Josie Altador, if he could ever play again. You know, it ain't going to be the same. Okay? Huh? Not anymore. It ain't about the X's and O's, it's about the Jimmy's and Joe's. It's an old Southern football coach. It's not about X's and O's. It's not about theory. It's not about technique, okay? It's about that. So don't forget that. Don't forget that, okay? That's really important. Um, is that the process of improving an athlete? Is it a straight line? I have to tell you, going back to the second clinic. So Bill Bowerman comes out. We need some chalk here. And uh, he, he draws a line. He puts, a, he puts a, a mark here like this, and he goes like this. And he goes, five minutes, four minutes. Because he was talking about developing a four-minute mile. And he takes and he draws a line just like this, a straight line. And he says, we started, what's five minutes, John? Uh, 75, right? Right, 75. He says, we start at 75 and we drop two seconds every three weeks until we get to four minutes. Damn, that is really cool. <laughs> so 
I go out and I mean I'm a fat ex football player and I start I start to run and first day I can run a quarter at 67. Cool. So the next day I figured well it's going to be 67 again, 69. Next day 71. I get discouraged. I take a day off, and the next day it's 66. I'm going well, wait a minute. Like five days into this, it ain't a straight line. It's what's it look like? It's kind of curved, right? And then what happens, you have bigger curves, and sometimes they don't connect. And then you have to figure out how to connect them. And eventually, you get to your destination. And so the moral of the story is, guys, it's a process. And we as coaches have means or methods to manage a lot of the process. But all we do and this is the revelation I'm going to share to you at age 67 and into the 45th year. All we do, a lot of times, and I've had this conversation the last few days with a bunch of you, is point them in the right direction a lot of times, don't we? We make sure they get to the pool on time or the track on time somewhere. And then that's the first jump. Show up every day. It's a process, isn't it? But it's not a linear process. But yet, you see, um, Peter Senge, who wrote the fifth discipline, I, treated it the other day. We think in lines, but life is circles. Which was an interesting way of looking at it. Okay? Um, know the basics. And, and I think when you get around the coaches that I've talked about, the staff, the coaches that have been back, guys like John Loraldi, guys that have coached for a long time, you're going to find out they know the basics. They get their athletes to master the basics, right? And they don't deviate. Because the biggest thing, Bill can talk to you about, it's okay if I use that, about going to Man U or some of the things that he saw there three weeks ago. Guys, it's basic stuff. You watch the World Cup. It's going to be basic stuff that's going to decide who's going to win or lose that. It's not going to be some sophisticated play. I guarantee you. It'll be somebody that didn't execute, man mark, play between the goal and, the, and, and their mark on a set piece or something. Or, or just some technical, simple aspect, okay? So that, again, goes along with simplifying, doesn't it? <coughs> ask yourself. Ask yourself this. Now, here's three questions. Ask yourself, how, are you affecting the lives of others in a positive way? And what I mean by that, Chris, I hope I'm not going to embarrass you by this, Chris Plum, but one of the things that I tell all the swim coaches and all the coaches I work with, you're going to be famous all over the world, the thing that impressed me from one of the first days I was there at Carmel, when his swimmers get out of the water, each kid, Bill, nice job, or something, you know, like that. Tomorrow, that was really good today, but don't grab the lane line on that backstroke. Now, I kind of heard it because I had my good ear on that side and things like that, you know. That's what coaching is. You see it all over. Everywhere you go, that's a difference maker. It's like the lady at... Sam's Club the other day that told me that if I didn't have my receipt, I was SOL. This is at Sam's Club. And I'm thinking, I'm shit out of luck. And I'm going, what is your story? So I said, just a second, because I don't want to be SOL. I'll go out in the car and get the receipt. And I said, am I OK now? But that's, that's not what it's about. It's remembering that, that we're working with people. And, and we're going to get people better. I wish I could get technology, Master Tommy. We're going to depend on you to figure this out. So, anyway, are you creating positive relationships with the people you coach? Tough, it's not always going to be positive. Sometimes it is going to have to be tough love. Um, you're going to have, I remember the story you told about your, four, your mile relay tow a couple of years ago. Sometimes you just have to say, go and tow the line, lady. We expect you to produce. Jim Steen, I was telling some guys today who's Foreign guys don't know, but arguably one of the most successful coaches in any sport ever, 31 straight NC2A championships. <coughs> I had coffee with him right before I went to New Zealand. We were talking about this. And he said, you know, Vern, I have one-on-one -on -one meetings with all my swimmers. And he said, the last thing, the thing, I, the most powerful thing I can tell them is, you can do better. And I said, Jim, do you say anything else? And he says, no. He said, you can do better. And that's not very complicated, guys. You can do better. Obviously, your tone of voice and your body language. Are you creating positive relationships with the people you coach? Okay, that's the same, same thing. 
Discovery consists in seeing what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else has thought to discover a vitamin C. You know, it's looking at the same movements and, yeah, that looks different. Same movement you've seen a thousand times, okay? So that's, that's my introductory talk. Hopefully it gives you some food for thought, leading into Clay's talk, which would be some more concrete tools that you can use. And uh, I, again, I, I think that those ideas for me, we're culled from what I've seen from you, the people right out here. Not just my career, but what I've seen, those of you that I've been able to interact with now. Obviously, some of you have had relationships with you for a lot longer period of time. So, so let's take um, just a quick five minute break. Um, if you want to change seats or anything, I'll get Clay set up. And take, uh, somebody help me and see if we can get rid of this thing, this white line. Exactly. You can do it. All right. 